Okay, welcome again. We are now session number two, the sustainable and healthy diet for now and in the future. It's a very important uh, question, which is now also linked directly to what we have to do with our nutrition and, and food intake. We have three eminent speakers for this session. The first one, if I have the next slide, is Professor Adam Dronowski. He is director of the Center for Public Health Nutrition and Professor Epidemiology at the School of Public Health at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he will talk about nutrition, nutrient density models, how to identify food that are nutrient dense, affordable and sustainable. The second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Stefan Peters. He is Nutrition Science Manager from the Dutch Dairy Organization in the Netherlands, the NZO, they call it NZO. And he will talk about how to decrease the environmental footprints of the diet. Quite an important uh, topic. And the final speaker for this session is Professor Wim Verbeke uh, from, the, from Belgium. He is Professor in Agro Food Marketing and Consumer Behavior from the Ghent University in Belgium. And he will talk about the consumer interest in healthy and sustainable diets. Now, as I said before in the first session, all three speakers will come along each other. And after that, we have the Q&A session again. Unfortunately, Adam Donoski is not available for this Q&A session. So you can only address your questions to, uh, to uh, uh, Stefan Peters and Wim Verbeke. And uh, let's see how that works later on. So let's start now with uh, Professor Adam Dronowski. So Adam, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Thank you for the introductions and thank you for the opportunity to present to the Friesland Campina Institute for Dairy Nutrition and Health. My topic today is nutrient density models and how they can help us to identify foods that are nutrient dense, affordable and sustainable. Let me go first of all to the disclosure slide. Um, I'm the originator of the original nutrient rich food model that you'll be hearing about in the course of this conversation. And I have received funding from a number of entities interested in improving the methodology to assess the nutrient value of foods. So let me begin with just giving you the basic thought. There are actually four domains of sustainability. We conventionally think of just two. We go directly from nutrition and health over to the environmental impact of food production. But in reality, there are four dimensions. There are nutrition and health, economics, environment, and society. And each of those domains has its own separate metrics and measures. Today, I will focus on just three, nutrition and health, economics, and a bit on the environment. And I will leave society for another time. So what metrics do we have to identify nutritional value of foods? Well, this is where nutrient profiling comes in. We can identify nutrient rich foods and we can also identify nutrient rich food patterns. What about economics? The concept of affordable nutrient density is gaining ground. Foods have to be not only nutrient rich, they also need to be affordable and available to the average consumer. And then, yes, we need to talk about the impact of food production on the environment and the metrics that we have include greenhouse gas emissions, but also land use and water use and energy use and a depletion of natural resources. But let's start with nutrient profiling. And here we have another concept to deal with. What actually is meant by nutrient density? Sometimes we conceptualize nutrient density as the absence of problematic nutrients, the absence of 
total fat, saturated fat, or trans fat, the absence of total added or free sugar, and the partial or total absence of sodium. What you see on the right are labels from Chile alerting consumers to the fact that the piece of chocolate can be high in calories, high in sugar, and high in saturated fat. So we think of nutrient dense or nutrient rich foods as those which contain no problematic nutrients. But there is a problem. What you see in the graph on the right is an example of nutrient dense foods taken from the dietary guidelines for Americans. And I was actually shocked to see that sparkling water was a nutrient dense food. But everyone knows that sparkling water or plain water contains no calories and no nutrients. So how could it be a nutrient rich food? It has no nutrients. So this is not the right way to go about it. And I'm sorry to see that this was actually included in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2025 edition. I prefer to think of nutrient dense foods as those containing beneficial nutrients, sometimes called nutrients to encouraged. So those nutrients will of course include high quality protein. They will include fiber, maybe whole grains. They will definitely include calcium, iron and zinc, iodine, vitamin D and vitamins, minerals and ingredients. Those are nutrient rich foods. It's not a glass of water. These are the nutrient rich foods and beverages. So my way to look at nutrient profiling is to combine beneficial nutrients with the nutrients to limit. So in nutrient profiling models, each food is awarded a single score that can be based on negative nutrients only, usually fat, sugar, and salt. Sometimes actually energy is treated as a negative nutrient to limit. Then you can have a score based on positive nutrients only, protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. But most often you have some combination of the two. So nutrient profiling tries to balance nutrients to encourage against nutrients to limit. There's a positive subscore and a negative subscore. You can have beneficial nutrients, but you have nutrients to limit as well. For example, let's take cheese. Cheese contains high quality protein. It contains a lot of calcium, but cheese also contains saturated fat and sodium. So is cheese good or is it bad? And I say, well, it all depends because you have many beneficial nutrients, but then in certain societies, some nutrients are overconsumed, and those are the nutrients to limit. So compensatory score balances out positive and negative, and nutrient density can then be calculated per 100 grams, 100 calories, or per, per serving. And then you have the underlying algorithm that you want to use. So the graph on the right actually comes from the European Food Safety Authority. This is the sequence of steps that you need to take in order to develop a nutrient profile model. I will get to those in just a minute. There are some basic decisions that need to be made. One of those decisions is how to select nutrients to limit and nutrients to encourage. So in a score that I developed, the nutrient rich food index, the nutrients to limit were easy. Everyone is using some combination of fat, sugar and salt. In this particular case, we took saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium. As I mentioned before, other scores use calories, they use total sugars, and in addition to saturated fat, they also use trans fat. But we use saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium. On the positive side, that is a bit more difficult. You have to select the right nutrients. So the ones we settled on were protein, fiber, calcium, iron, potassium, and magnesium. And then we used vitamin A, vitamin C, and in the early versions of the nutrient-rich food score, we used vitamin E. The reason we did not use vitamin D 
was because data for vitamin D were not actually available at the time. The United States Department of Agriculture did not have them. The moment we got them, we swapped out vitamin E for vitamin D because vitamin D is a very important nutrient and vitamin D was also identified as a nutrient of concern in the dietary guidelines for Americans. So the current version of the NRF score has protein, fiber, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin D. Nutrient profiling is not a new concept. The score I'm showing you was actually developed in 2008, but recently nutrient profiling has enjoyed what I been, have been calling a renaissance. Everyone wants a nutrient profile to call their own. This is how things generally work. The purpose of nutrient profiling is to separate foods which are energy dense, top left, from those that are nutrient rich, bottom right. On the top left, you have the sweets, the fats, the oils, the refined grains. On the bottom right, you have low energy density vegetables and fruit and salad greens. And then, of course, you have things like fortified cereals. Dairy, shown here as blue dots, can span a whole range. On the nutrient-rich side, you have skim milk and low-fat milk and low-fat yogurt. And then up above, you have cheese. Towards the left, you have ice cream, dairy desserts with more saturated sugar, more saturated fat and more added sugar. Notice that I do not use the terms good and bad to differentiate the foods. And also notice that within each food group, there's a continuum of energy density scores. For example, not every fruit and not every vegetable are equally nutrient rich. Some are more nutrient rich than others. And nutrient profiling gives you a quantifiable way to assess nutrient density of those foods. Let me now compare the nutrient-rich food score to another well-known score, the Nutri-Score. That initially began in the United Kingdom as the Food Standards Agency score. It was called FSA Ofcom for short, where Ofcom is for Office of Communications. And then this was adapted by the French government to become a French score, but actually it's British. So here we are comparing the NRF index to the Nutri-Score and notice that both include protein and fiber. Protein and fiber on the left, protein and fiber on the right. Then you have saturated fat added or total sugar and sodium. And then on the Nutri-Score side, you have energy. Energy in Nutri-Score is treated as a negative nutrient to limit. In other words, energy is bad and needs to be penalized. Nutri-Score does not have vitamins, calcium, iron, potassium, or magnesium, but it does award points for the content of fruit, vegetables, legumes, and nuts in a given food. When the content of fruit, legumes, and nuts exceeds 80%, then a complicated algorithm kicks in, the protein points are counted, and the score changes dimensions a bit. It's kind of a bit complicated to explain, but pretty much the underlying principles are similar. In both cases, you have positive components and the negative components, and the negative components are fat, sugar, and salt. Let's move on. I mentioned that Nutri-Score includes on the negative side calories, total sugar, and saturated fat, which means that Nutri-Score actually captures calories and not much else. So here you have some scatter plots looking at Nutri-Score points applied to grains and cereals in the United States Department of Agriculture database. You have Nutri-Score points on the horizontal axis, 
And then you have the Nutri-Score codes. With Nutri-Score, the higher the score, the worse things get, and you go from green to pale, green to orange, to brown to red, as you go from the A score to B to C to D to E. But what you're seeing here is that the Nutri-Score points are very closely related to added sugar in the graph on the left, and they are very, very close they related to the limiting subscore of the NRF because added sugar, saturated fat and sodium per 100 calories are pretty much equivalent to a Nutri-Score. I would say the two are completely collinear. My point is that the Nutri-Score captures energy density of foods and not much else. And if that is the case, why just not just use energy density and be done? And then you come, this is the next slide, to contextual differences in nutrient profiling of foods. So what nutrient profiling does is to give you an overall rating of nutrient density or nutritional value of foods. But the goal of nutrient profiling is to address and if possible remedy an identified public health problem. So in rich countries, called high income countries by the World Bank, that problem was obesity and overweight and non-communicable disease. People eat too much. So as a result, rich country nutrient profiling models typically penalize calories, fat, sugar, and salt in order to prevent obesity. But that is not the case when you go to Africa and Asia. In those countries, the major public health problem is undernutrition, inadequate nutrient intakes, nutrient deficiencies, and hidden hunger. So as a result, poor country nutrient profiling models favor protein, especially high quality protein. Those models favor vitamins and minerals and fortification in order to prevent undernutrition. So what is healthy in terms of nutritional value of food very much depends where you're coming from, a rich country problem or a poor country problem. So one issue, of course, is that nutrient profiling models have not really addressed protein quality. And you know what? They must. Because in rich countries, most of the protein is from animal sources. As a result, protein quality is never an issue, and protein quality was never incorporated in any of the nutrient profiling models. But we have now a tendency and trend towards plant-based diets. Those diets provide protein. That protein is not of the same quality as the protein from meat or dairy. Nutrient profile models do not handle this at the time, at this time. There's another issue. Many of the products coming on the market right now, including plant-based beverages that serve as milk replacements, contain very little protein or none at all. Consumers prize them for having plant-based protein, but the amount of protein can be surprisingly low. So here's a small study I did identifying plant-based beverages marketed as milk alternatives in the United States. The analyses were based on the USDA branded food products database, which is gigantic, 239,000 foods of which I identified 600 foods as plant-based beverages. Those were almond milks, coconut milks, and then beverages from soy and cashew, other tree nuts, flax and hemp, and peas and quinoa and rice. So I was able to search ingredient lists for specific ingredients, and I was able to look at patterns of fortification, protein content, and so on. What you see on the right is an extract from the ingredient list. Notice that 
Protein comes from pea protein, rice protein, and then there is added sugar, dried cane syrup and dextrose, and then you have fortification with magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin B12 and others, and then you have emulsifiers and stabilizers, which of course means, I'll come back to that later on, that the pure plant milks are in fact ultra-processed foods. So here we have again our friend, the Nutri-Score, showing a very nice correspondence between the nutrient-rich food index, 5.3, and the Nutri-Score, an inverse relationship. Remember, with Nutri-Score, higher scores are bad. With the Nutrient Density Score, higher scores are good. And what you see here, that the plant milks don't score very highly on Nutri-Score, but there's another component. Nutri-Score does not take fortification into consideration. So on the bottom of this graph, you see that some beverages which get the same score, five on Nutri-Score, actually have a range of nutrient densities based on the NRF index. And those are the ones, of course, which are fortified. Nutri-Score does not take fortification into account. It is all about added sugar and saturated fat. This is to show you that there is a great deal of individual variability in fortification patterns. For example, almond milks, top left. Individual milks within this category, calcium fortification can go from zero to 100% daily value. Okay, energy density will depend completely on the amount of added sugar and it can vary as well. Almond milks are generally low in saturated fat. Soy milks on the bottom left are the only ones with consistent fortification policy. Similar amounts of calcium, about 30% of daily value or thereabouts. Fortification with vitamin A and vitamin D. Those milks contain very little sodium very little saturated fat, no fiber, and these are actually higher in protein than most. So actually, interestingly, the USDA recognizes soy fortified soy milks as part of the dairy group that does not extend to other plant-based beverages. On the right, you see a spider plot again showing huge variability in the nutritional content and fortification patterns for the plant. One more component. I mentioned before that protein quality was highly variable depending on protein source. So milk and eggs, protein digestibility corrected amino acid score is 1.0. But then you go to peas and cereals and peanuts and rice and wheat, and you plunge down from 1.0 to 0.78, to 0.7, to 0.5, and so on. And in the United States, PDCAS correction is required for products marketed to children and those that make a protein claim. Plant-based milk alternatives make no processed claim, no, make no pr protein claim because protein content is very low. But for example, um, plant-based meat analogs do make that claim and again notice that the protein comes from multiple sources. So rather than have protein from milk and eggs, plant-based proteins have to come from multiple sources to provide the complement of amino acids and these will include, you see here on the right, pea protein, rice protein, bean protein, potato protein, soy protein isolate and others and of course, they are fortified with minerals and vitamins generally present in meat, which would include zinc, in some cases iron, vitamin B12, B vitamins and so on. So notice that the fortification pattern is all very different from the milk replacements. So what you see on this slide based on 378 foods from the Fred Hutch Food Frequency Questionnaire is that only animal foods 
have got sufficient protein in grams per 100 grams to be interesting. Going from the right is going to be pork and beef and chicken and fish and cheeses and then eggs and lower down milk and yogurt. And then above you see seeds and nuts, but they're the only ones other than legumes with appreciable amounts of protein. And in fact, the plant-based meat analogs are trying to hit 15 grams per 100 gram protein similar to cheeses in the United States database. So a couple more things. We've used nutrient density to do more than just assess nutritional value of fruits. We are very interested in measuring the relation between nutrient density and cost. And this has absolutely everything to do with the search for affordable healthy diets. Diets need to be healthy and affordable. Affordable nutrient density is key. So the nature of the global food supply is such that the starchy staples, the added sugars and the vegetable oils are among the lowest cost sources of calories. In contrast, unprocessed nutrient rich foods generally cost more. So where do we go to get low cost high quality protein, low cost calcium, low cost vitamins and minerals? Do we need to go towards fortified foods or are there some natural foods which have been overlooked as the sources of calcium and high quality protein? This is about affordable nutrient density worldwide. This is from the USDA archives. This is about how to measure the cost of food. People have argued that the cost of food really ought to be done per kilogram of a given food or liter of beverage. But back in 1902, the USDA actually suggested that a low priced article is not necessarily a cheap source of nutrients. Cabbage seems to be cheap, but provides virtually no protein and very few calories. But wheat flour, slightly more expensive per weight, actually provides 0.4 of a pound of protein and five thousand calories of energy. There was no mention of vitamins on, at the time. They had not yet been discovered. This is going back to 1902. So this is now a way to assess food prices. I do it per 100 calories initially, but we can also do it per 100 grams of protein, or we can also do it for daily value of calcium. In terms of calories, things fall out the way you think. The more expensive foods per calorie are going to be seafood, top left, vegetables and fruits and condiments and sauces. And way down on the bottom in terms of cost will be sugars and fats and oils. The sugars will include sugar beverages, so energy density is low. And then towards the right, you put sweet bakery goods, refined grains, cereals and so on. So basically, you see the cost is going to be high for vegetables and seafood and below for refined grains, fats and sweets. We knew it. And then you turn it around and you say, what about nutrient density? Sweet bakery goods, fats and oils, sugar, low nutrient density and low cost. But as you move towards the right on the nutrient density score, you move towards the seafood and the fruit and the juices and other foods, including plant-based proteins, everything does cost more. So basically, calories are cheap. For the most part, nutrients are more expensive. This is the way it is. And this takes me to the issue of environmental cost and environmental impact. So people have said that healthy foods are not necessarily more expensive than less healthy ones. 
or they said plant-based foods are more planet-friendly. Yes, this is true, but only as long as you price by weight. So greenhouse gas emissions, as you see on the bottom right side of this slide, greenhouse gas emissions are typically calculated per kilogram of a food product. What about pricing per thousand calories? What about pricing per hundred grams or a kilogram of high quality protein? Or how about pricing per 100% daily value of calcium? Anything but a kilogram. And the point I'm trying to make is that a kilogram is not a good metric of nutrition. Kilogram has nothing to do with anything. Compare here calories and the nutritional value in terms of protein of cabbage, beef steak, wheat flour, and Swiss cheese. Cabbage, no calories. Flour and cheese, a lot of calories per kilogram. On the right, again, cabbage, no protein. Steak, not a protein. Cheese, protein. Wheat flour, less protein. And as I said before, not the same quality as the protein from beef steak and Swiss cheese. So kilogram is not a good measure of nutrition. And a lot of the work that has been done on a plant-based diet has actually been based, I think, on a miscalculation. So the Eat Lancet diet was all about rice and wheat and corn and potatoes and cassava and vegetables and fruit and legumes and nuts with minimal amounts of dairy and animal proteins. But take a look at what happens when you stop looking at environmental impact per kilogram. Here we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions per 1,000 calories of food. This slide is in French, but you'll see that it goes from beef to lamb, to shrimp, to cheese, to more fish, tomatoes, pork, milk, chicken, and ends at the very bottom with sugar, soy, peas and nuts. So the planet friendly calories are going to be nuts and peas and corn, palm oil, soybean oil, sugar, cassava, potatoes and peanuts and corn and wheat. But not all of those foods give you protein, a critical nutrient. So here, when you start redoing it by protein, corrected for protein digestibility, which means for protein quality, take a look at the new position of cheese and milk right next to cassava. Take a look at poultry and eggs and pork right next to rice. Beef is still at the top and nuts and peas are still at the bottom. That is true, but everything else shifts position, especially milk and dairy. So I would say that we need to recalculate all the calculations on the future diets. Again, this is not a new idea. My friend and colleague Nicole Darmont in Marseille and her team have been way ahead of us for a long time because here she published a paper some time ago showing that high nutritional quality was not necessarily associated with better environmental footprint. On the contrary, beef produced more greenhouse gas emissions, starches and sweets and fats produced the least, but things were slightly different when you calculated things per kilogram, 100 grams, or per 100 calories. The moment you start calculating per 100 calories, weight of the food makes less of a difference. So to summarize, Nutrient profiling has been used in a different number of interesting ways. Those have included regulatory and educational activities, nutrition health claims, scientific basis for front of pack symbols and logos, regulating marketing to children. And then nutrient profiling has been used in the development of dietary guidelines. 
But to my mind, the most important use of nutrient profiling has been to guide product innovation and reformulation by the food industry, because nutrient profiles are actually the basis for reformulating processed foods to achieve higher nutrient density. So companies have been doing voluntary review of nutrient density of their product portfolios, and they've been looking at whether or not the reformulated nutrient-rich foods are appealing to the consumer. The Access to Nutrition Index Foundation has been doing a review of company portfolios, looking at the nutrient density of the global food supply. There are, of course, innovations in nutrient profiling. I'm going to end with this. We now are looking at category-specific models for dairy, for fruit, for vegetables, for beverages. It's a new trend. We're definitely looking at protein quality, animal or plant. There are nutrient databases for phytochemicals, flavonoids and polyphenols. We're making use of those. There's an emphasis on fortification. And there is even more because the new hybrid scores combine nutrients with dietary ingredients. And the dietary ingredients of interest are dairy, fruit, whole grains, and nuts. And then, of course, we're looking at relating nutrient density of foods to the monetary and to environmental cost. So in summary, nutrient profiling can be used to estimate nutrient density, affordable nutrient density, and the environmental impact. Keep in the back of your mind the thought I just planted with you that all the concept that all plant-based foods are planet-friendly really relies on the continued use of the per kilogram metric. I say that is not correct. And based on protein content, dairy products have carbon footprints similar to that of cassava and rice. And their nutritional value is higher. Then, of course, the plant-based milk replacements and meat analogs are engineered ultra-processed foods that really throws into doubt the entire concept of ultra-processed foods. The distinction now stands, stands counter to innovation and is no longer productive. So milk, yogurt and cheese remain natural as they always were. And also there is a social value to food products, but that is a topic for a further study. I said I would talk about nutrients, economics and the environment and leave the topic of society and the social embeddedness of foods for another day. So I'm going to finish here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you for this introduction. Again, my name is Stefan Peters from the Dutch Dairy Association in the Netherlands. And this, of course, is also my conflict of interest because I represent the Dutch dairy industry in different domains and especially, of course, in the domain of health and environment. Um, in my job, we did a lot of research on the ecological effects of the diet. And um, um, I want to show you some results that we have obtained with a quadratic programming tool. It's quite complex, but during my presentation, you will find out that it gives you excellent insights in how you can change your diet to increase or to decrease the environmental footprint of your diet. Um, but let me start with my introduction. I think the general rule that we are normally confronted with is that to decrease the environmental footprint of our diet, we should eat less animal and more plant-based products. And this is also expressed in different reports, the Eat Lancet report, and also Greenpeace and NGOs, they, um, they um, communicate these conclusions. And there is a promise in this less animal, more plant-based diet uh, eating rule. And we did some calculations, similar calculations that these NGOs did, and to see how we can, uh, what is the potential of decreasing the environmental footprint of our diet by changing the current diet towards other more environmentally friendly diets. And 
in this slide, um, um, I, I have to tell that all my uh, data are based on the Dutch LCA data, Dutch nutrient consumption, uh, nutrient data, um, nutrient composition data, sorry, and the Dutch food, um, Dutch food consumption survey. And what you see in this figure on the left side here, let me get my laser pointer. This is what we consume on average. This is the average uh, Dutch diet. And this is the ecological footprint. And I have expressed during my presentation all in CO2 equivalents. So this is the CO2 um, uh, footprint of the average Dutch diet. And what we did, we made calculations similar like different NGOs uh, did to see if we would decrease or, or delete certain animal based foods from the diet what CO2, uh, what the effect will be on the CO2 footprint. What you see in this first bar, the red bar, is we deleted dairy. And with deleting dairy and optimizing for dairy in a, in a healthy way, you can decrease the environmental footprint of the diet by approximately 5 until 7%. Going vegetarian, so leaving out meat, and with, 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 with additions of different uh, animal products, you can um, decrease the environmental footprint of your diet by approximately 25 until 30 percent. And it is possible, and that is on the right side, the yellow bars to decrease the environmental footprint of your diet by approximately 40, 40 percent by going vegan. And so you can conclude that based on this assumption, eat less animal based products, that the ecological footprint, so the CO2 footprint of the diet, can decrease considerably. And the potential is going vegan and adding an egg. And surprisingly, adding an egg to vegan will, will, will um, decrease the vegan footprint even more. And the potential is 40%. So from the average Dutch diet, what you eat on average, until a vegan diet, this is what I call the, the, the window of opportunity. So 40% decrease in CO2 footprint. However, this is a quite simple representation because what often is not told is that this left diet and the diet with dairy and the vegetarian diets are diets with a lot of choice and with a lot of variety. And this vegan diet is a diet with hardly any variety. And um, um, I will come back to that later. So actually what we are talking about when we want to achieve a 40% decrease in the CO2 footprint of the diet, we have to change the diet enormously and take out all variety. And this is what uh, mostly is not told to us. Now, this is the potential. And now, why are we talking about less animal, more plant-based diets? Well, this is based up on the data and we have seen, uh, we have been talking during this um, uh, conference um, several times about it based on life cycle assessments. And life cycle assessments, they are just a sum up of the CO2 footprint of the different stages of food production. And if you conclude, sum up these, uh, these data, then you can express the carbon footprint, so the CO2 emissions per kilogram of product. And if you look at the CO2 emissions per kilogram of product, then you can see indeed that Animal products like rump steak, cheese, etc., have a relatively, or not relatively, a really higher carbon footprint per kilogram than plant based products. So, based on these kind of data with an expression per kilogram, you can assume that if you would decrease these kind of foods of your diet, that um, the, diet, the, the CO2 footprint of the diet will indeed uh, decrease. However, the Animal based products from a nutritional point of view are completely different than the uh, plant based products. And if you look at the average Dutch diet, you can see what um, animal products, what nutrients um, uh, animal products provide for. And I've got two examples. Of course, animal products provide for high quality proteins. And this figure is also based on the Dutch food consumption survey. And here you can see, and those are the purple parts, are eggs. The green parts are meat and the blue parts are dairy and what minerals these animal um, products uh, provide for in the average Dutch diet. I see that, that when we take 30% or more that then calcium, phosphorus, iodine, um, um, selenium, heme iron and zinc are provided for by um, um, animal products. 
one step further, the same accounts for a lot of vitamins. If you look at more than 30% is provided for by animal products for vitamin A, B1, B2, B3, B4, and vitamin B12 and vitamin D. So it's if you want to decrease animal products from the diet, you have to uh, compensate for these um, nutrients by the plant-based uh, products. And this is a complication in changing the diet. Um, and before I go in, into to the effects of, of changing diets on CO2 footprints and, uh, and, and also on the price, because we have to pay for the alternative products, um, there is one often used argument. And that argument is, OK, the, the, the changing the diet will be very easy because there are alternative for meat products and for dairy products. And what if we replace um, dairy products and meat products for the alternatives and the alternatives that are marketed as such in the supermarkets? Then everything will be easy because the CO2 footprint will decrease. But also here, it's not that simple. Have a look at this figure. What they did here, and we did not do that, but the, the Dutch Public Institute of Health uh, did uh, similar calculations. They used the same model that we ha have been using, so Optimil. I will show you what it can do in a moment. And they did the following. They took a starting point, the average um, diet of the Dutch, <laughs> of Dutch women in this case. And what they did is in the model, they put out uh, meat and they put out dairy by 30% or 100%, and those are the white and the black bars, and then calculated the CO2 footprint. And what you see is then when you um, omit um, dairy and meat from the diet, then indeed you can decrease um, the CO2 footprint by 30%. And if you will decrease dairy and uh, meat by 30% and replace them all by the um, assets marketed alternatives, then the decrease in CO2 footprint will be approximately 10, 15%. However, although these are enriched products with calcium, with um, um, protein and, and with vitamins, this is the result on the, um, on the diet when it comes to uh, the nutrients that are uh, shown in this figure. And what you see here is there are two good points because the saturated fatty acid content of the alternative diet will decrease. The fiber of the diet will increase logically because it's more plant, there are more plant-based products. And this is in percentage, by the way. But there are other surprising effects because the protein intake of replacing meat and dairy by um, alternatives um, will decrease the protein intake will decrease calcium although these products are enriched in calcium the calcium intake will decrease by approximately 30 percent the same for zinc for vitamin a vitamin a even lower um, vitamin b2 and b12 they will decrease in the diet vitamin d will increase a bit because a lot of alternative meat products are enriched with vitamin D. However, still uh, you will not um, um, become to the, uh, uh, reach the, the recommendations, vitamin D recommendations, because in our country it's, it's way, way too low. The point I want to make is that based on the promise of the plant-based alternatives that they will um, have two effects, decreasing the environmental footprint, so the CO2 footprint of the diet, that is a potential promise that can be made. On the other hand, the uh, replacement of animal products by plant-based products is not nutrient neutral. Actually, if we would do that, a lot of um, um, consumer groups will potentially receive too little of these nutrients. So replacing and going from an um, um, average or animal-based uh, um, diet to a more plant-based diet is not as simple as it looks and also not as healthy as you would expect in the first place. So these are the complications of a plant-based um, diet transition. To get better insight, and, and, and we need to know more about um, 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 this uh, food or consumption transition. And consumption transition is not only about the health effects, so, so the, the nutrients and the health effects of foods or the, the ecological effects, it is even more complex. 
And I would like to show you before I will um, jump to, 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 to the, the results we have obtained with, with OptiMeal, the four principal dimensions of sustainable diets. And also during this symposium, you've heard these, these, uh, these four dimensions um, regularly. Um, we want to have an alternative diet that is healthy and nutritious. And the alternative diet should have a decreased environmental footprint. But this is not all. We also want this alternative diet to be economically friendly for producers, but also for consumers. If the price of the alternative diet is much higher, then a lot of consumers will not be able to pay it. And then it will also not be accepted. That's a cultural aspect. Um, if the alternative diet is changing a lot from the current diet, then consumers would probably not <coughs> um, adopt this alternative diet because it's culturally unacceptable. So these are the four dimensions that, that you have to take into account when changing a diet with as goal a um, uh, uh, ecological, more friendly diet. Now, as I have been telling you, um, 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 all the calculations that I, I have been showing you are calculations of a diet in the future and the how a diet should look like in the future and then with the potential ecological benefits. So, for example, the Eat Lancet diet, and I will come back to the Eat Lancet diet in a moment, or the diet with, with, with the, the, the vegan or vegetarian diet, are diets that have been defined how they should look like in five or ten years. But we have a current diet, a current average diet, and this diet should be changed. And with OptiMeal, we can see the effects of changing the diet and, and changing food groups in the diet and what the effects are on the CO2 footprint and also on the price in the supermarkets. And now this is the more, most complex part of my presentation. So I have to concentrate to you to, 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 to explain to you how this works. So maybe you have to concentrate a little more also. But I'm going to show you um, what um, um, quadratic programming is about. And, and if you uh, understand this, this explanation good, and then you will um, also see the results and which might, that might surprise you. Okay, let's start with this screen. What you see in the screen is the following. Um, on the y-axis, you see grams of products. On the x-axis, you see different food groups. And these are the most food groups that we talk about also in our food-based dietary guidelines. You see the grams expressed in 144 grams of vegetables, 371 grams of dairy, and this is what we consume on average in the Netherlands based on the Dutch Food Consumption Survey. Now, we want to do some modeling with this, uh, with this diet, and, and, and uh, the modeling uh, would be fairest to start with a healthy diet. And we all know that what we consume on average is not the most healthy diet and not most in line with the food-based, the dietary guidelines of the different countries. So the first step I have to make is to make a small jump with a, with a product group and then um, OptiMeal will make an optimization. And this optimization, what you see now on the screen, are different starting amounts of the different food groups and they show an, an, an optimized diet according to the Dutch food-based dietary guidelines with um, 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 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Um, 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 and this is also in accordance with the, the salt recommendations, vitamin, minerals, um, 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 saturated fatty acids recommendations. So all these, uh, this diet complies with all those recommendations. And now we can start playing because the data behind, we do also have the um, food composition of all these different foods that are in these food groups. And now something um, interesting um, um, uh, can be carried out with this model. Um, what we can do is the following, and this is the um, principle of quadratic programming. If we take, for example, meat, and we are going to decrease meat from our diet, what OptiMeal does is the following. I'm going to decrease the meat intake in the diet by steps of 20 grams. And when I decrease the meat intake in the diet, then um, I will lose, for example, iron, I will lose um, uh, B vitamins, and I will lose um, protein from the meat. And what OptiMeal subsequently does is when decreasing my meat intake, it will find other food groups that can compensate for the nutrients I am losing when decreasing meat intake, and it will compensate by other foods. 
And what would be logically if I would decrease my mean intake? And now you see uh, when with decreasing my mean intake, other bars growing, that I will have to, co to uh, consume more beans and pulses, some more fruits and vegetables, and some more fish. And this alternative diet has got exactly the same uh, amount of uh, micro and macronutrients. And so decreasing meat intake will have as consequence they have to consume more fish, probably because of the protein, more beans and pulses, etc. Doing the same for dairy, decreasing my dairy intake by steps of 20 grams. But we all know I will lose a lot of calcium and I will lose some protein, etc. And the calcium, the alternative calcium will come from, for example, leafy vegetables. And when decreasing dairy, you will see that I have to consume much, much more vegetables to compensate for the calcium. Have to compensate a bit more fish, a bit more, uh, uh, much more beans and pulses, and more nuts and seeds to compensate for the B vitamins and also for the proteins. So this is what it does. And um, 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 so any alternative diet that you see as do, does totally comply with the food-based diet guidelines. Okay, this is just for starters because we were talking about eating less animal, more plant-based diet. Optimal also contains different data of 210 foods. It also contains the carbon footprint of these foods. And now things become more interesting because we are talking about, for example, decreasing meat intake. And if we are decreasing our meat intake, we will be compensating for the nutrients we are losing by other foods. And then we can have a look at what the sum of these foods, um, what the sum of the carbon footprints of these foods is. So if I will decrease my meat intake, I will get an alternative diet. And in the meantime, we can have a look at how, what uh, is the carbon footprint of this alternative diet. So decreasing meat intake, look at the carbon footprint. Indeed, the alternative diet will have a decreased carbon footprint. So indeed, eating less animal-based products when it comes to meat will result in a lower carbon footprint. So this is okay. Let's take bread, for example. If I will increase, this is a plant-based food, increase my bread intake, or actually whole grain intake, then also the same happens. Increasing whole grain intake, with example, bread will decrease the carbon footprint. And now we go to dairy, because dairy is a very nutrient-rich product. Now, if I will decrease my dairy intake, I have to compensate for by nuts and seeds, beans and pulses, by eating much, much more vegetables and some more fish. And what you see is that this alternative diet does not have a lower carbon footprint than one would expect based on eating more, eat less animal, more plant-based products. Why is that? That is because you have to eat much more beans and pulses. I have to eat much more vegetables. And the sum of all the products I have to compensate for by, by uh, for the nutrients I'm losing with, with decreasing dairy in my diet. So the sum of, of all those products, the sum of the carbon footprint of all those products is approximately the same as my starting diet. And there's something else. We were also talking about the cultural acceptability. If I will decrease my dairy intake and compensate for it in a healthy way, the alternative diet is extremely different from my starting diet. So there are two complications. One, decreasing dairy intake and compensating for my dairy intake in a healthy way will not lead in the expected carbon footprint decrease. And the alternative diet is very different from the starting diet, so culturally not um, acceptable. I've got one other example, increasing vegetable intake. One would uh, expect that the carbon footprint would decrease, but it does not. And the same accounts for food. I will come back for that later. Now, we were talking about the, the, the ecological uh, effects of the diet and also talking about the acceptability of the diet, but also about the economic effects of the diet. And now we can add an other value, and this is the price of the, uh, of the diet. So if I will start, for example, with my, my meat intake, I can, I, we already know that when decreasing meat intake, that the carbon footprint of the diet will decrease. If I will decrease my meat intake, I have the expected decrease in the carbon footprint. But if you look at the price of the supermarket, market, uh, supermarket basket, it goes up, it increases. So decreasing meat intake, Compensating for it in a healthy way will lead to a decrease in the carbon footprint, but an increase in the price. Let's take two other examples. Um, bread and whole grain products. If I will increase um, 
bread and whole grain products in my diet, will, this will result in a decrease in the carbon footprint and a small decrease in the price. So this is very interesting. Whole grain products are healthy, um, CO2 friendly, and uh, for the price in the supermarket basket, it's also very friendly. And then finally, there are a lot of results that I can show you in this. If we decrease our dairy intake, we already know that the alternative diet will change considerably. We will not have the expected carbon footprint, but the alternative diet, and look at the price, have to pay more and more and more for the alternative diet. So decreasing dairy in the diet will not result in a, in a decreased carbon footprint. It will result in a completely different diet, and the diet, uh, the alternative diet, is much, much more expensive. So these are some results that we have obtained, and we did not, as you can see, only do this calculation with dairy. We used this model with, with, with all different food groups to see if um, all, all, all uh, uh, results are, are, are um, scientifically responsible and substantiated, and they are. And actually, these results have already been peer-reviewed by other groups. So these are the results so far. Um, I will come to, to some general conclusions of how you can apply this to eating rules, to healthy eating rules, healthy and ecological friendly eating rules. So I hope this gives you some insight in the uh, changes that we can make in the diets. We had one surprising result, as you can remember. This is the, 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 the surprisingly effect that if I would increase um, fruits and vegetables in the diet, that the CO2 footprint would not go down. While we all regularly hear that increasing the plant-based products in the diet will lead to ecological, more friendly diet. Well, this is simply to explain. And we, we did the following study. What we did here is, again, we took an average vegetarian diet, so not an average um, um, Dutch diet, but vegetarian diet. And in the model, we um, have put out all plants, uh, all plant-based products, and replace them by, on the one hand, exotic fruits and vegetables, and on the other hand, locally open-air produced Dutch fruits and vegetables. And what you see here is the explanation why we do not see any results in the optimal tool, is that exotic, so uh, fruit and vegetables that have been flown into the Netherlands, have got a higher ecological footprint, and that locally produced have got a low ecological footprint. And if you look at the difference, you see there's a 40% difference between eating a vegetarian or um, um, exotic vegan diet when you um, um, consume only exotic um, um, fruits and vegetables or locally produced fruits and vegetables. This is a difference of 40, 40%. Remember in my introduction, if you would change your current diet to a vegan diet, then the potential decrease could be 40%, but then you have to consume only locally produced open air Dutch products. And that means that you have to, to eat a very um, unvaried, um, uh, a bit boring um, Dutch diet. Now, my conclusions for the Dutch situation, based on these calculations and all the data that we have from LCA data, is the following. If you want to decrease your ecological footprint of your diet, you have to eat less calories and according to food-based diet guidelines, obviously. You have to eat less confectionery products and other extras. So leave out the snacks of your diet. You should eat less red meat and then especially imported red meat for the Dutch situation. And imported red meat is, is, is um, what, I, what I always say is uh, dedicated produced uh, meat to, to be consumed, so beefs. That's an, the, that has got a higher ecological footprint than um, uh, red meat that comes out of the dairy chain. Eating more whole grain products will also be healthy and decreasing the eco ecological footprint of your diet. Eat vegetables and fruits, preferably more vegetable and fruits, according to the rec recommendations, and as local as possible. Keep dairy intake at current level and drink less soft drinks and less alcoholic beverages. And if you would take all these rules into account, this will result in the lower CO2 footprint of your diet. And a more general conclusion, especially for the dietitians and the food professionals uh, among you, eat a less animal, more plant-based diet is not the right paradigm for decreasing the environmental footprint of your diet. The devil is in the details to do it correctly. And a food transition to a more plant-based um, um, diet 
will result in less variety in the diet and with the potential pitfalls when it comes to um, um, the nutrient intake. Of course, as I already told you during the disclaimer, um, 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 I'm from the dairy industry, so you could say, okay, we would have expected this conclusion, keep dairy intake at current level, but our um, um, calculations have already been uh, calculated before we started with this project and after. This is a project of about 10 years ago, and the dietary changes that are needed to change the UK diet um, um, in order to, 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 to keep the average global temperature rise below 2 degrees. And here's your current diet and the diet in the future. This should be 2030. And also here you see approximately the same, eat more plant-based products. And the dairy part is this one. And the dairy intake will be the same now and in the future. And if you look at the Eat Lancet diet, this is the Eat Lancet diet expressed in the figure by the people of the Eat Lancet. Also here, it is eat less animal-based products, but still a considerable amount of dairy should be included in the diet. So also for you, I think it's really important to, to if you want to, if you are talking or discussing about a more sustainable diet, it is just more than decreasing the environmental footprint of the diet. The health part and the nutrient part should be safeguarded. Changing the diet to, be, to make it more environmentally friendly would include a guarantee of the healthiness and the nutritiousness of the diet. And to make it successful, the diet should be culturally acceptable and also consumers should be able to pay for the diet. Now, again, these are my uh, conclusions and I think the, uh, actually these are quite logical conclusions. And I know that the um, uh, representation of the optimal results uh, I gave you is, is a very information dense and, and gives you a lot of insights. If you want to, to, to have a look at these uh, data yourself, we have made a, a public website in which we have a, a simple video again explaining the results that we have obtained by Optimal and also the principle of quadratic programming. And if you want to play with the results yourself, you can go to this website, see the video and also uh, get some more insights in the results that I have just shown you. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, my name is uh, Stefan and, and my Twitter account is Stefan Den Haag because Den Haag is where I live. And if you do have more questions, then you can always um, um, email me at my email address and uh, a bit later also during the, the panel discussion. So I hope to see you again in the panel discussion in a moment. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this presentation on consumer interest in healthy and sustainable diets. Consumer interest uh, in healthy and sustainable diets um, is situated within a context shaped by multitude of factors. And uh, this slide just provides us with uh, a couple of examples that matter. First, we see growing expectations from food production, processing, retailing, as well as from the resulting food products. Um, at the same time, there is a multitude of factors shaping consumer interest in healthy, sustainable eating, which means many things that need to be taken into account if we try to understand consumers' food choices. Um, several studies also indicate a substantial citizen attitude consumer behavior gap. We will also uh, illustrate one of those examples. And finally, the choices people made now make nowadays they they happen in a digital environment where information is readily available although the quality of of information can often be disputed in the following slides i will present you some background uh, results from studies where each of those uh, contextual factors are are illustrated if we look at growing expectations from food production and food products, and uh, if we look back, let's say 25 years uh, since today, we, we know that by the end of the 19th, there were some major food safety issues. Um, in, the, in the years that followed, healthiness became more important. Uh, from time to time, safety issues popped up again. 
A bit later, environmental friendliness became more important. Uh, the term sustainability gained interest. And more recently, authenticity is also an issue uh, about which consumers uh, have high expectations. One constant, however, has also been that our food has to be tasty, first of all, and second, also affordable. Um, interestingly, is that consumers expect reassurance about these attributes, not only during the stage of food purchasing, but actually nowadays at any moment that may suit them. Uh, when I mention a multitude of factors shaping consumer interest in healthy, sustainable food, then we have to consider, first of all, a whole range of personal determinants, as they are uh, listed here, together with environmental determinants. And those also interact with each other. Within the environment, um, there are micro and macro factors relating to producers, organizations, retailers, but also the broader socio-economic, technological, political, legal environment is shaping consumers' decisions and also their interest in healthy, sustainable food. This means that a multitude of factors have to be taken into account if we try to understand and study food choice. Uh, as a third example here of those contextual factors, uh, this uh, result from a study that dates back already some time uh, illustrates the citizen attitude consumer behavioral intention gap. And the case here is a case of sustainable dairy. Um, basically, in this study, we, we asked a sample of, of young consumers about their attitude towards buying sustainable dairy products. And this attitude could be either weak or strong. And we also asked about their intention to buy sustainable dairy products. And also intention could be rather weak or strong. When we look at the combination of attitude and intention, we see four segments here or four groups of consumers. Um, a group with weak attitude and weak intentions and then the opposite, strong attitude, strong intentions. Typically, uh, strong attitude towards buying sustainable dairy was associated with a high involvement, a high perceived importance of making sustainable choices. A strong intention to buy was strongly associated with a high perceived consumer effectiveness. And that means consumers believe that their choices can really make a big difference. You can also see from the numbers here that the share of women and the share of urban uh, consumers is highest in the strong, strong uh, segment. Uh, so that means those with a strong attitude and a strong intention to buy sustainable dairy. Um, this segment has a consistent attitude behavior pattern and that also holds for this segment. They don't feel very much about buying um, sustainable dairy and they also don't plan to do so. But there are two segments that stand out to some extent. Um, the first one is, is this segment here, uh, um, a strong attitude towards buying, but still a very weak intention to do so. And the main determinant explaining that inconsistency in this case was low perceived availability. These consumers simply did not believe that it would be easy or, or simply feasible to purchase sustainable dairy products, although they would really like to do so. And the other inconsistent uh, segment is a segment where uh, the intention to buy is quite strong, despite a weak personal attitude to do so. Here in this case, the explanatory factor was a high social norm. People in the environment, in the social or family environment, they were expecting this person uh, to purchase uh, sustainable products. So a multitude of factors play a role and also help us to understand why the citizen attitude consumer behavior gap in some cases is uh, so present. Now, if we talk about sustainability, 
we, we, we have to be aware that this is a very broad and multifaceted concept, and it can mean many different things to different people. Uh, it is associated with planetary health, with economic viability, but also with social welfare, and this is also where human health comes into play. This uh, typology is also known as the planet profit people typology, and with one factor referring to the ecological component of sustainability, the second to the economic component, and a third to the societal dimension of sustainability. Here in this study, we, we asked a large sample of consumers in several European countries, um, to what extent do you think the following issues have something to do with sustainability? And uh, the scores here are mean scores on a five-point scale, so we see that especially the ecological factors are top of mind when people are confronted with the term sustainability. They think about deforestation, uh, the impact of human use of land and water, recyclable packaging, and so on. Um, in blue, we see some of the more health-related factors or the social dimension of um, sustainability. The healthiness of food and drinks, food and drink safety, for example, but these do not rank as top of mind. And the same goes for the economic factors, which are here indicated in red. Uh, actually, when we talk about sustainability, ideally we should talk about um, the, the, the common ground between those three dimensions. Nevertheless, um, when people have to make choices, they often have to weigh different characteristics or attributes. And here is an example of a study where we investigated attribute importance when purchasing cow's milk. And the question was, how important are the following attributes to you? And the least important was packaging, and that's a mean score on a five-point scale on the left-hand side. And the most important was freshness. Um, interestingly, price, affordability, ranks somewhere in the middle. And um, a number of factors are, are apparently more important in this particular case. Taste, healthiness, quality, food safety, and of course also freshness. Um, whereas some other factors are, are clearly less important. And those are the ones that more relate to sustainability. Fair trade, local production, production methods, sustainability, environmental friendliness. So if we, we have to think of a ranking of attributes, then sustainability is indeed important when consumers make a choice, but it's uh, less important than price, and it is less important than other attributes such as taste, health, and safety. So this may be a reality we have to uh, be aware of. Another study here, uh, quite an interesting study that was done in France, um, investigated the environment versus health dilemma that consumers may face when purchasing animal products. And uh, the main idea behind the study was to find out to what extent consumers may be torn between buying for health reasons versus avoiding a certain product for environmental reasons. And the study looked at meat, fish, and dairy products. And for example, if we look at dairy products and at the, 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 the bottom uh, row here, composite variable, it's just an indicator, uh, is telling us that in this sample here, 5% of the consumers they felt torn between buying for health reasons and avoiding for environmental reasons. This is a relatively small number, and it is much smaller in the case of dairy than in the case of fish or meat products, for example. But within this study, the authors also tried to look at uh, factors that associate with feeling or perceiving that dilemma. And uh, one of the conclusions was that participants reporting such dilemmas between buying dairy for health reasons and avoiding it for environmental reasons, that those participants were generally older, lower educated. They also had a lower intake of dairy products. But interestingly, they also had a diet of better quality overall. 
And this led to the final conclusion of the study that having environmental concerns is not inconsistent. So it is consistent, it matches with a diet of adequate nutritional quality. Um, so suggesting that it can be perfectly feasible indeed to uh, make dietary choices that are beneficial both for personal health as well as for the environment. Um, so some of the previous examples seem to suggest that health is not automatically or not most strongly associated with sustainability in consumers' perceptions, but at the same time that a match may also be feasible. So let's uh, explore this a bit further. Here in this case, um, it's a study where we show that consumers associate many different attributes with each other. And at the same time, they are well, well aware of, of the fact that they may have to make some inevitable trade-offs. And the case here was more attention to animal welfare in, in uh, livestock production. Um, it will yield products according to consumers that are more acceptable, that have better quality, and that also are more healthy, better environmental uh, friendly. So health and environmental friendliness here in this study, they show up together. Huh? There seems to be quite a match. They are associated with each other. And the trade-offs that may have to be made, they are at the bottom here of this list, they have to do with availability, with profitability for the producer, and with price. So that means that consumers may be well aware of the fact that a healthy and sustainable choice may be a more difficult choice, may be a more expensive choice, and also leave less profit for the producer. So that trade-off is um, something consumers may, may have to deal with. Um, most recently, uh, this study uh, was done within uh, the Eurobarometer series of studies by the European Commission. Um, most recently, it demonstrates that consumers associate nutritious and healthy as top of mind when they are facing the, the, the idea of sustainable food. So that, that's quite a, a game changer. Uh, and these are really recent data that um, are based on a sample size of almost 28,000 consumers covering all European Union countries. So nutritious and healthy are the first issues that people associate when hearing the ID sustainable food. So quite, quite interesting. Um, but of course, in a similar vein, as we saw with sustainability, that can mean many different things to different peoples. Also, a healthy and a sustainable diet can mean many different things to different people. And uh, this was also from the Eurobarometer, a question that brought about that. Eh, what do you think uh, eating a healthy and sustainable diet involves? And um, clearly, there are strong associations here with dietary guidelines. Eh? People uh, spontaneously associate eating a healthy and sustainable diet with a variety of different foods, a balanced diet, more fruit and vegetables, eating seasonal, local, uh, more home-cooked meals. So a healthy, sustainable diet is clearly also in consumers' mind increasingly associated with dietary guidelines. And at the bottom, we can see that eating a healthy and sustainable diet may mean much more than simply eating organic. And it may also mean much more to consumers than simply making uh, choices for products with the lowest possible carbon footprint, which is, which is quite favorable in, in that sense. Now, looking a little bit at organic, yeah, because uh, spontaneously, organic is often associated with healthy, sustainable diets. Um, despite the overall favorable image of organic, as can be seen from this Eurobarometer result here, it is still perceived as 
more expensive and it is in fact also still more expensive. Uh, so the strongest association that uh, emerges here is organic products are more expensive than other food products. But apart from that, most of the associations are clearly favorable, uh, safe, taste, respect for the environment, better quality. Um, this study uh, gives us an idea about the, the trade-off that consumers have to make between price and purchasing organic. Um, the question here was, to what extent are you willing to pay a premium price for organic yogurt? And uh, within the sample here, we identified three types of consumers based on the frequency of purchasing organic yogurt. And we had the non-buyers who never buy organic yogurt. We have the habitual ones who, um, in this case, purchased, I believe it was seven, at least seven out of 10 times organic when they purchase yogurt. And then we have the occasional buyers uh, in between. Now, the willingness to pay a price premium and, and the degree of that price premium, it ranged from 15% among the non-buyers to 40% among the habitual buyers. And if we look at the market situation, interestingly, um, the actual price premium for organic yogurt in the market was indeed around 35, 40%. So this is consistent with the willingness to pay that we could also record in a survey among habitual buyers. But um, clearly consumers who never buy organic yogurt, they are only willing to pay a price premium uh, of 15%, which is less than half of the actual price premium premium of organic yogurt. Uh, this also raises an interesting question, namely what would happen in case the price premium between conventional and organic would be simply 15%. Would that eventually mean that the whole market shifts to organic? Hmm? It's an open question. I don't have the answer right away, but it's something we, we can think of if we see this type of, of data. Now, in, in most of the previous examples, we have been aggregating eh, and we have been reporting mean scores. That means that we have been considering markets as being homogeneous. This is not a reality. Most markets are heterogeneous. That means that uh, consumers are not all alike and that we cannot take interest in sustainability by all for granted. Um, so this is then calling for what we call a segmented approach, segmentation, targeting, positioning. And in uh, some of the following studies, I'm going to uh, provide you with some examples of such segmentation uh, studies. Now, segmentation, uh, a very simple way of segmenting the market is by using a, an age-related variable, uh, simply looking at age. And then you see, for example, here, um, a study with consumers in several European countries, but only with elderly consumers, 65 plus, and on quite recent data. And the question was, to what extent do you accept to eat food products that contain the following sources of protein? And clearly among this elderly population group, um, the more fancy alternative proteins like insect or in vitro or single cell protein are not strongly accepted. Uh, they are also not, not well known. People are not familiar with those uh, things, certainly not in this age group. But uh, what scores best here in terms of acceptability is the traditional, the conventional dairy-based protein uh, as, as being very acceptable as a um, as a protein source among this age group. If we would have done the study with a younger population group, then probably uh, the, the results would be slightly different. Eh? So insect-based, for example, would be much more acceptable in that case. So consumers are not all alike. This is simply an example of an age-related segmentation. But in another study, we uh, went a step further. Uh, here we 
segmented uh, the market based on involvement with healthy eating on the horizontal axis and involvement with sustainable eating on the vertical axis. And uh, so involvement means perceived importance of health or sustainability when making food choices. Um, this study resulted in the identification and profiling of four segments. Uh, um, health and sustainability involved at the top right and the opposite uninvolved at the bottom left. Um, across this, uh, this axis here, the red line that uh, is uh, on the screen, we see a consistent pattern. Uh, low interest in health and sustainability, moderate interest in health and sustainability, up to a high interest in both concepts when making food choices. One segment stands out, and that is the blue one here. Um, it's called health involved, eh? people who value healthy eating higher than they value sustainable eating. Eh? Personal health is still for a substantial share of consumers more important than the health of the environment. And that's clearly visualized here with this one segment consisting of uh, about uh, one fifth to one quarter of the of the study sample. We also profiled those segments. And um, starting with the uninvolved, we saw here a higher share of males, um, middle age, single, lower educated, unemployed. Opposite, health and sustainability involved. There we saw a higher share of females, uh, middle higher age, and higher education. Moderately involved, again, a predominantly male segment, younger males in this case, lower education, again, full-time employed, and the health involved, again, we see a clear uh, dominance of female consumers, families with young children, higher education, and part-time employment. So this gives us an idea about segments, their existence, and also their profile, which can be very useful when we envisage uh, to target them with specific communication messages. When moving from the uninvolved to the moderately health and health and sustainability involved, and so when we follow the direction of this red arrow here, we see generally increasing levels of food-related health concerns, self-reported healthy eating, subjective healthiness of the own diet, and also attitude towards and consumption of plant-based diets. So there is quite a consistent pattern here when we uh, compare those different segments. Within the same study, with the same study sample, we tried to map um, an image profile of a healthy, a sustainable, and a plant-based diet. And uh, if you look at those profiles here, you see that they strongly match. Huh? So the healthy in blue and the sustainable diet in red, there is a strong match between both in the way they are perceived by consumers. Um, interestingly, both are also perceived as rather as being associated with plant-based than with animal-based. And so that's an issue to be taken into account. So what this slide is telling us is that there is a strong perceived match indeed also among consumers between a healthy and a sustainable diet. What are now main implications for advising on more healthy and sustainable dietary choices? I have summarized uh, three issues. The first one is providing easy decision rules rather than a vast amount of information or yet another label. And I'm using a picture here of a crossroad as a metaphor, uh, as a situation that clearly uh, provides an overload of information. And in the end, it also yields uncertainty among the users of this crossroad. Um, what can consumers do in this case to make a decision? They can simply ignore the information. They can try to process it systematically but that takes a lot of time and effort, and only in exceptional cases, people would 
do that effort, for example, in the case of allergies. Um, in the worst case, they may avoid and search an alternative route. Uh, in the future, they may switch to substitutes. But ideally, consumers would prefer easy decision rules, which are also called heuristics. Here in this case, that would mean they follow the car in front of them that manages to cross that, uh, that crossroad. Um, so this is also explaining the success, for example, of brands and, and claims. As a second take home message, I would say it's crucial to trigger and activate consumer motivation. In this study, we investigated the frequency and the use of health claims. And one of the key drivers in that whole process was motivation. So trigger and activate consumer motivation um, was here a key driver of health claim usage, can also become a key driver in making healthy, sustainable dietary choices. And finally, as a third take home message, uh, the idea is to provide not only fact-based knowledge and information, but also make people feel they know. And because here in this study on organic vegetable consumption, we uh, found out that subjective knowledge was a much stronger driver and determinant of behavior than objective knowledge. Objective knowledge mattered, of course, also, but it was mainly subjective knowledge that did the job here. So provide knowledge, but also make sure that people feel they know. Finally, let's summarize what this talk has uh, tried to uh, communicate. What were the issues? We spoke about the citizen attitude, consumer behavior gap, sustainability as being perhaps less important than health, price in between. We uh, demonstrated a strong match also among consumer perception between health and sustainability. And we also illustrated that dairy is strongly accepted as a sustainable choice and causes the least dilemma, for example, compared to other livestock products among consumers. And the take home messages had to do with segmentation, targeting, adapting messages, providing easy decision rules, triggering consumer motivation, providing knowledge, and above all, give consumers the feeling they know. Thank you for your attention. The floor will be open in a few moments for questions.